thank you everybody who's here. Um, thanks for making time with us for tonight uh, to join us for another ACT virtual speaker event. Um, we are dipping our toe into the pool of in-person events, but we're not quite there. So we're absolutely thrilled to see you guys here today. Um, for those of you who I have not had the pleasure of meeting yet, my name is Saul Potashnik. I'm the Outreach and Member Services Director here at ACT. And before we begin, um, I know you probably just got a message, but we are recording tonight's event for future viewing. So if you prefer not to be on that recording, please uh, just do whatever it is that you need to do, keep your video off, um, as that will be posted on the YouTube uh, later, probably in about a week or so. Uh, I wanna start by thanking our speaker, Lori Jean Kinsey for joining us tonight. Lori is the executive director at the Tin Mountain Conservation Center in Albany, New Hampshire. Uh, Lori's worked at Tin Mountain since 1986, first as a teacher naturalist and then educator, education director, and then finally Tin Mountain's executive director. Uh, I know we're all excited to hear what she has to say, what she has to share. So I'm going to try to wrap this up as quickly as I can. But before I do, I just need to go through a few housekeeping notes and then I will hand it over. In the interest of keeping things running smoothly and with minimal confusion, everyone will remain muted for the presentation, though there will be a chance to unmute to ask questions at the end. Questions can be asked at any time using the chat function. If you're unsure of how to get there, just wiggle your mouse and you'll see the chat icon pop up in the bottom left of your screen. Just click on the icon for the chat screen to pop up, then type your question and hit enter to send. Please send to everyone. Um, and if it's not already set that way, there is a drop down that will give you the option to get to the everyone option. We have two moderators tonight, myself and Sheila Higginson. Uh, we'll be watching for questions as they come in and pass them to Lori at the end of the presentation. So don't be afraid to ask as she's speaking. We will make sure that those get over to her. Uh, there will also be a dedicated question and answer at the end, at which point you'll also have the opportunity to turn your videos on to ask questions either through the chat or by raising your hand and asking a question verbally. To find the raise your hand function, wiggle your mouse and at the bottom right, uh, you'll see an icon pop up called reactions. You can click on that and you'll see the raise your hand option at the bottom of that screen. Um, if you're on an older version of Zoom, you may need to click participants at the bottom of your screen first um, for the raise your hand option. Now that we've all gotten our Zoom refresher for the day, <laughs> I'm going to pass the virtual mic over to Lori for the main event. Uh, please enjoy and thank you again for coming. All right, thank you very much to the Amanusi Conservation Trust and to Gal for uh, uh, coordinating uh, this presentation uh, this evening. Um, as uh, was mentioned, I'm the executive director of Tin Mountain Conservation Center. And for those of you who don't know what Tin Mountain or where Tin Mountain is, we're located in Albany, New Hampshire, just south of the Kangamongas Highway. We have a facility there with 300 acres of hiking trails and it includes fields and forests and even a lovely eight acre uh, pond with an active uh, beaver family in it and all kinds of interesting birds and, uh, and of course, wildflowers. So um, we uh, are an environmental education organization, contract with our local schools, do a lot of programs Locally, I was saying we do also work up um, in with the Franconia Elementary School over the years. I enjoyed, I've always enjoyed coming up there to work with, uh, with those folks. We are in the middle of summer camp and we run a nature program sim series similar to programs such as this. And then lastly, we also have a research arm to Tin Mountain where we do native brook trout habitat restoration work and also a lot of avian uh, bird research mostly uh, census uh, and just keeping track of who's around during the course of the year, as well as um, how they react. We own some forestry lands and how birds react to different kinds of forestry practices. So if anybody would like any more information, go to our website, it's tinmountain.org and there's all kinds of information to be had there. So anyway, on with our program this evening. I love wildflowers and I kind of look at 
uh, the year through the lens of both, I'm going to admit, wildflowers and birds, who's around when. And to me, it's kind of like seeing an old friend you haven't seen in a long time when those first spring wildflowers show up, um, trailing arbutus and um, our other spring ephemer ephemerals. And as we move through the season, you know, the next thing you know, it's trilliums and lady slippers. Uh, we have a lovely mountain laurel patch that blooms in, in late June down at Tin Mountain. And uh, next thing you know, you're seeing oxide daisies and golden alexandra. And when you see the first black-eyed Susan, that's uh, when you know that I think you're in the heart of uh, summer. Any of these pictures that are on the screen right now, and we'll be talking about each, uh, each one of those in just a minute. Oop, now why is it not wanting to? Oh, it's not moving here. Oh, there we go. Um, one of the big differences between, I think, uh, summer wildflowers and some of our other, like, let's say, spring ephemerals is that they're everywhere. You take a walk down the road, there's flowers. You're in a field, there's flowers. You're by a wetland, there's flowers. And there aren't just a few. This was a picture I took this morning, and there was no fewer than seven flowers blooming in here asters and goldenrods, numerous kinds of asters. Uh, there was some meadow sweet in there, uh, purple vetch, uh, a variety of different programs. Whereas if I think about spring flowers, they're mostly in a woodland um, setting and uh, you get a few, oh, you, you definitely have some in your uh, lawn and uh, around the edges. But for me, it seems the summer, they're just much more uh, prevalent. We're gonna do a quick review of pollination here just because I will be mentioning it throughout the uh, program. Basically, for flowers to be pollinated, the pollen needs to move from one place to another. We have our stamen here with our anther, which it has the pollen. And then this pollen needs to move into this part of the flower called generally the pistil, specifically the stigma, travels down this tube into the ovule where the seeds are formed. How does that happen? Happens a variety of ways, mostly through insects, can be bees, can be butterflies, can be birds such as hummingbirds, and it also can be uh, wind, can be poll uh, a pollinator as well. It's best if um, plants, most plants need to have it be from one flower to another, same, same flower, black-eyed Susan to black-eyed Susan, but versus self-pollinating uh, is, uh, is what I meant by that. Now I'm gonna throw the composites in here because they kind of um, confuse things a little bit in that a composite flower is just that, many flowers on one seemingly one big flower. But they, and that's your daisy, that's your gold rock. You're gonna see, I'm gonna repeat it over and over. There's a lot of composites out there, but they have these showy ray flowers. And then they have the little disc florets in the middle here, each one of those being a little flower. And if you think about it, each one of those will produce a seed. Think about a dandelion, all the little fluffs of seeds that they have. Many, many uh, seeds are formed. But let's get into our, our um, flowers that we'll be uh, looking at tonight. As I mentioned, black-eyed Susans um, are one of the first flowers um, that I notice as in, in the heart of summer. And uh, again, in a composite family, very common flower uh, growing in open places. Uh, one lone flower sits atop a bristly stem. And I would encourage uh, everyone, whether you have a field or you uh, grow black-eyed Susans in your garden, leave them at the, um, once they go past, try to hold back from cutting them back in your uh, garden beds because the seed heads make for great winter bird foods for lots of birds from finches to chickadees and, and so forth. So, and that's, that goes for all of our, all of these flowers that, that we're talking about. Um, another common uh, flower around that same time, of course, is Queen Anne's Lace. Um, another name for that is uh, sometimes people call it the wild carrot. And that kind of comes from two names. It has a root that looks very much like a carrot, but unfortunately it doesn't really taste like a carrot. Apparently it's not too, uh, not too tasty, but um, they do have a strong uh, smell to them, which actually um, attracts quite a few different kinds of pollinators. They attract more than 60 varieties of bees, butterflies, and uh, other insects. 
It's a very common flower. Some people even kind of borderline call it an invasive. It is a non-native uh, plant found throughout the lower 48 and throughout uh, Canada. I have this very um, strong memory of being up at Prince Edward Island and just fields and fields of Queen Anne's lace, which uh, were quite beautiful, but I, in that case, probably uh, an invasive there. And the plant, I, I'm very interested in kind of the cultural history of some of these um, flowers as well. The, the name um, comes from Queen Anne, who was very fond of lace in her uh, costumes uh, during, the, during that time. Now, some people could confuse Queen Anne's lace with yarrow. You can see kind of the similarity in that. Well, actually, the Queen Anne's lace is, is the flowers in the form of an umbel, almost an umbrella shape. Yarrow is pretty much a flat topped um, flower and uh, the leaves are very are quite different. Again, grows in just kind of almost really waste kind of places by the side of the road, really sandy um, area areas. This uh, plant also has a very strong odor, especially, particularly if you crush, uh, crush the leaves uh, on it. Um, and uh, Native Americans and the early colonists would use, um, oftentimes, I, I think teas were made from the leaves or flowers to treat fever and, uh, and disorders of the, uh, of the skin. Now, this is one of my uh, favorite summer wildflowers. And this is really kind of in its full uh, bloom right now. And that is the Joe Pie weed. It's a large, uh, plant. And this is also um, a, another composite. Um, check out the number of monarch butterflies on this plant. There's one, there's at least four in this picture right here. So uh, it has some um, super strong nectar there that these butterflies are certainly um, attracted to. Um, it's a very tall plant. I mean, it can be over five uh, feet tall, tends to grow in wet environments. The picture on uh, this picture right here is in Pondicherry. And if you've walked down uh, uh, the trail there on either sides in the wetland, it's a very, very common uh, site to uh, see. Now you might wonder where it got its name. Who was Joe Pye? He was a Native American that used to travel around quite a bit and, um, and sell the uh, um, the benefits of Joe Pye weed, and that it apparently was a cure for um, typhus um, as well as kidney problems. So um, again, Joe Pye weed. If you see Joe Pye weed, look closely then for this next flower, bone set. And the thing that I find intriguing about this plant is not even so much the leaves. I mean the flower, but the leaves. If you look very closely at the leaves right here. The leaves perforate the stem, all right? The stem goes right through the middle of it. It's widest in the middle, tapers off to the end. There's this practice called doctrine of signature, which is uh, a belief that there's something about the plant that um, tells you what it would be good to be used for. And in this case, People looked at that and thought, oh, it's probably great for mending broken bones. Well, it, um, it may, um, but it also was a very common herbal medicinal plant in our early, uh, uh, both the Native Americans and, and the settlers. It was very common to find in drying and hanging to dry in attics or woodsheds, um, and it my research said historically one of the most widely used plants medicinally, uh, the tea, besides healing broken bones, the tea was used as a fever reducer, treatment for colds, snake bites, rheumatism, constipation, influenza, and so forth. Um, and, but it, I, apparently it also tasted terrible. So uh, it was, had a lot of benefits, but uh, you had to choke it down, I guess. But Bone set grows in a very similar environment that the Joe Pye weed grows in these kind of wet, swampy areas. Not quite as tall as the uh, as the Joe Pye weed, but a fairly large uh, a large plant as well. And believe it or not, another member of the composite family.
Now, here's a lovely flower. I, I like the common flea bane. It's very cheerful uh, uh, flower. And, you know, a lot of people would look at it and just consider it a weed. And I don't have the heart to pull it out of my garden. It's just, it's quite tall. And uh, um, I'm all about uh, having as much variety for pollinators um, as, as possible. So I, I love it, let it hang out around the edges uh, of my garden, but you would find it growing in a lot of, you know, in your field, along field edges, along roadsides. Again, it can be six to 30 inches high, so it can be quite tall. This ray flowers, there can be as many as 150 individual little flowers in there. Um, and it re received its name after the superstition that if you hung the dry flowers upside down in your house, of course, it would drive out fleas. So that is our common flea bane. Common mullen, what a fun plant. I uh, was on a field trip last week with David Gavowski, who I'm sure many of you know, up at Pondicherry, and we saw this giant mullen alongside the rail trail. And it was their opportunist. It was just in an opening in the forest a tree you can see there had come down. And so it was this nice bright sunny spot and the mullen uh, moved in and that thing was huge. I bet it was a good seven feet, uh, seven feet tall. So mullens um, can vary in size from much shorter than that to quite tall. Interesting the way they bloom. You'll never see it of just the whole stalk blooming at one time. It kind of goes in bits and, and pieces. Um, apparently, uh, it has a, quite a sweet nectar, um, which attracts bees and other insects. But the leaf is really what is kind of the star of this flower. It has this basal rosette of these very fuzzy leaves. And then the fuzzy leaves kind of go up the side of, uh, of the stem. Now, uh, a thought was that these leaves were, was an adaptation for catching rainwater and they would direct it down to the roots of the, uh, of the plant. Um, but um, it's the, the entire stem is also hairy and um, a lot of this fluff was used by something like a hummingbird to line um, their nests and many birds uh, eat the seeds. Once, once they bloom and they're pollinated, you can literally just shake the stalk and hear the seeds in there. So another one, save that uh, in your backyard and, uh, and see who comes to uh, be eating uh, the seeds on that all throughout the winter. Um, they grow in rocky soils, hill, hillsides, waste areas, or in the middle of, well, the, on the edge of a forest in this case, where it took the opportunity um, to move in after this blowdown came down. I always have been intrigued by uh, this little flower here, the field pussy toes. And uh, again, another composite, this white fuzzy flower gets its name from the fact that if you take your finger and you just rub the top of it, it literally feels like the bottom of a cat's foot. And uh, they're really a very pretty, uh, flower. I was out yesterday morning right after it had rained and they literally were just sparkling with the raindrops on their leaves. The leaves are this kind of um, minty green whitish color and um, if you see one pussy toe you're going to see quite a group of them as you can see in this um, picture here. So that is our field uh, pussy toes. All right now these two flowers or shrubs, I should say, um, these are ones that I, don't, I tend to get them confused. So I put them side by side so we could really see the difference here. On the left, we have speech steeple bush. They're both spireas. Um, so steeple bush is this, it tends to be pinker in color. They have, true to its name, a very pointy tip to the flower. It's literally growing in the, uh, right next to this wetland. Uh, and um, they, uh, and you can see there's some yarrow growing right beside it as well. So that's the steeple bush. The one I confuse it with often is meadow sweet. And you might say, 
I don't see the similarity, but once they're by themselves, you go, hmm, which one is it? But Meadowsweet is more of a whitish flower that has a pink tinge to it, but I'd go Stephen Bush is much pinker. And Meadowsweet is um, much um, short and squat, rounder kind of, uh, of flower. Again, another spirea. Um, and, and this, it can be found in wet areas, but it also could be found by the side of the road or just in a field. Uh, that was one of the flowers I saw this morning when I was out taking a, taking a walk. Um, and meadowsweet is actually um, a, one of, a favorite food of a deer, white-tailed deer. Um, so here we have the steeple bush and the meadowsweet shrubs. Now here, I have to say, is probably one of my uh, favorites. And this is a flower that I saw last summer at Pondicherry. It was located um, under the power lines on the main thoroughway in there. And this is a flower called a gentian. In this particular case, the narrow leaf gentian. And part of its unique characteristics are number one, its color. There are very few blue flowers and it is really blue, maybe a little purplish in its presentation, but pretty much a blue flower. And then it has this unique club shape and it never opens, which is like, huh, well, why? What's the advantage of that? Well, having a closed um, petals like that certainly helps protect your pollen from being washed away if that is an issue. And with heavy summer rains, you could see where that could be potentially a problem. But how do pollinators get in there? Well, there are some tenacious ones, typically the bumblebee, and they pretty much just force their way into the small opening that is there. And interestingly enough, the bumblebee is also one that can fight its way into, and we'll get to this plant in a minute, a turtle head, which is also very tightly closed, and um, oh, uh, Dutchman's britches in, uh, in, the, in the spring. So they have really long tongues that they can stick them way into the flower to get to the nectar. And here's the, um, here's the other thing about gentian is, it's worth your while because it has, uh, it's one of the richest flowers in nectar quantity as well as quality. So it, a flower can produce up to 45 milliliters of nectar and it, it's 40% sugar, which is a high ratio of sugar. Some, some plants just have higher ratio of sugars than others. So gentian's right up there for, makes it worthwhile for the, uh, for the bees. Now, um, and I'll have to admit, I, I looked at them, it's like, okay, well, is this narrow leaf? The other option would be bottled gentian. And um, in comparing the two and, and asking a good botanist friend of mine, he, he, I, he agreed with me it was narrow leaf. And it really had more to do with the arrangement of the leaves. Narrow leaf obviously has very narrow leaves, but um, it also is gathered, it's really bunched at the top, but apparently bottled gentian uh, is much more spread out down the, uh, down the stem. But it is, it is a possibility that you would see bottled gentian around. So um, they do tend to, it's a biennial, so they, um, it takes two years. You know, these flowers, once they're pollinated, they'll drop their seeds. It's going to take two years for them to grow, but there was a nice little patch of them there. So I'm would be pretty convinced. Well, I'm certainly going to go looking for them again um, this year when I go back up there uh, in late August. So that's the narrow leaf gentian. Then, of course, we have jewelweed or spotted touch me not. And, and these, these guys are everywhere right now. Um, and uh, have this beautiful orange trumpet like flower. And uh, they have spots on it, hence the spotted touch me not. Um, and the shape and design of the flower is perfect for hummingbirds. I have a, a bunch of these growing right off of my back deck and I'm entertained every night by the hummingbirds zipping in here and taking a nice long drink out of the jewelweed. I don't even have a hummingbird feeder. There's enough different variety of plants right around here that the hummingbirds just come to uh, on their own. It gets its the touch me not name from the seed pods. Now this isn't the greatest, but starting to swell right there. And you want a little fun, just go 
very lightly tap it and boing, the seeds uh, shoot out. And I did one the other day. And I'm telling you, that thing jumped a good four or five inches away from the plant. That's the idea. You're trying to spread the seeds away from the mother plant to be able to grow uh, without competition. Um, so that's where the touch me not part. The jewelweed, you can see again with water on the leaves, it somewhat um, sparkles. Jewelweed is also a good antidote for poison ivy. If you feel like you got into some poison ivy or it was itchy, um, and I think even with uh, stinging nettles, you take the jewelweed leaf and you just rub it on your skin and that should help with the itch, the sting or whatever it is that is, uh, that is bothersome. They tend to grow in wet areas. Um, you can see them along streams and so forth, but I mean, they're just also on the edges of fields and in a mix of your typical summer wildflowers. That's the jewelweed. American spikenard is uh, one of the few wildflowers that actually you would find more in a forested area. And at this point, I'm gonna say, you're probably gonna see more of the berries than the actual flower. But um, you might still, I, I did see one blooming uh, just last week. So it has these almost like fireworks looking uh, flowers, these heart shaped uh, leaves with tubes, and then these delicious berries. They're a member of the ginseng family. And, um, and it is, uh, has a very aromatic root, but the, even the berries, which are edible, um, kind of have that ginsengy taste to them. But you're going to uh, have to um, act, act quickly because it's a popular berry with all kinds of birds and particularly chipmunks. Um, so um, the American spikenard, and that it, spikenard, and that is a flower of rich uh, woodlands. We did have that. We do have that at the center across um, on some uh, land across the street from where our center is. Now, this is an interesting flower. I was very excited when I first saw this last week, again, up at Pondicherry with a field trip with Mr. Gavatsky. And uh, I knew right away it was an orchid, the shape of the flower, the stalk, it was beside the trail and um, hadn't really, been familiar with it before to find out it's called helleborine and it is just that a member of the orchid family the flowers are purple or green and they grow in this raceme or this stalk the upper lip of the flower is loaded with uh, nectar and then they've got this great landing platform for the insects to come in stick their long proboscis or or um in to get the uh to get the nectar um, I guess I came to find out um, was that is actually an invasive orchid. Now, I thought that was kind of interesting, but apparently um, it, it, what it does is it uh, takes over the mycorrhizae of our native orchids. Now, mycorrhizae is a fungus that um, certain plants have to grow, have to grow in conjunction with in order to uh, to bloom. And so that herein lies the problem with the helleborine. Um, we only saw one, so I wasn't overwhelmed uh, by how many of them that they were. And it, it really was a, a pretty orchid, but that is the problem with most invasives. They do tend to still have some uh, qualities about them that are endearing to a lot of people. Common St. John's wort. This is a um, very common flower of of the uh, fields and again, roadsides. You know, first glance, you might even think it's a, um, a goldenrod, but it is uh, a member of the St. John's wort family, has these um, big yellow showy petals, many, many stamens protruding uh, out from uh, there. And um, I was interested to find out that this plant was used extensively and is still used extensively as an anti-anxiety and anti-depressant drug. As, as recent as 1996 there, or even into the early 2000s, there were a lot of studies 
um, that looked at it as a alternative to something like a mainstream drug like Prozac or something like that. So that was kind of uh, interesting to, to read. Um, and I think you can, you can, it's in the form of pills or teas or something like that in a natural food store or something, or something like that. Um, you know, I, I guess the findings of that didn't really uh, prove too much, but um, interesting that still after all this time, it is considered a uh, uh, useful for anxiety or depression. Common St. John's wort. This was a new flower for me last week that I learned. When you think about clover, of course, I think most of us think about purple clover or white clover that grows in our, our yard, which can grow maybe to four, five, six inches in height if it's really doing well and it's beautiful and it um, is just great nectar for uh, a lot of bees and other insects. The sweet white clover is a flower that, this was very tall. It was, it can grow three to eight feet in height. And um, it's actually a member of the, of the pea family and uh, very aromatic as many of the clovers are. And uh, if you look at it uh, close up here, the flower smelled and the leaf smelled, but boy, it lined the uh, side of the rail trail in different places um, along, the, along the path. Mixed amongst the sweet white clover was this flower here, the common evening primrose, another one of our yellow flowers that are so common in the summertime. Another tall flower, interesting habits in that its name, as its name suggests, it actually blooms predominantly at night. We did see some blooming during the day as we took our uh, our walk, but because of its nighttime blooming, it tends to be pollinated by moths, which are our uh, nocturnal insects for, um, for pollination. So um, that is a, um, a plant that is eaten by deer. Many birds seek out the seeds. And believe it or not, Japanese beetles love to eat the leaves. So maybe you could have it as a deterrent for uh, keeping them out of, your, uh, out of your garden. Here's an interesting flower, the virgin bower. And um, this is a vine. And this flower, literally, this picture came from my backyard just the other day. It was a dense mat of this, which makes for a great edge from the field into the forest. I think it's probably more commonly known for its very interesting seed pod that we have right here. So um, it's a member of the buttercup family, um, tends to grow in wet areas, and it has this pretty white flower that then once pollinated forms these tufts, which each one of these white tufts is attached to a seed, but they're very spidery and ethereal in their um, in their presence there. So that is uh, the virgin bower. And they, it does grow in these really very dense uh, thickets. Kind of similar, the seed in design to fireweed. Now I think people are, might be familiar with this plant. It's known just as its name suggests for coming in after an area has been burned and it tends to come in pretty dense uh, thickets. Oh, boy, a couple of weekends ago, we were heading up to Lake Ambagog for a, a trip and we went past a huge patch of this right by the roadside and it was just, uh, just beautiful. So again, forms this spike, you can see it kind of blooms from the bottom up. Um, and then once pollinated forms these, um, you know, white filaments. And this is great for wind, pop, wind dispersal uh, and spreading the seeds in, uh, in that uh, manner. It's a highly valued food for bees. And, um, and I don't know if that's because, you know, once a fire goes through there, that there are not a lot of options. So, you know, if the fire weed is blooming, that is one that they will certainly take advantage of. All right, the one you've all been waiting for, goldenrod. <laughs> I am speaking in defense of goldenrod tonight because goldenrod gives a uh, gets a bum uh, rap 
with hay fever. A, a, a lot of people confuse the fact that goldenrod is the culprit that causes summer allergies, when in fact, it is this guy here, ragweed. And common ragweed is a very plain green flower, not very noticeable, can be actually pretty tall, uh, flower that is wind pollinated. That's the big difference. Goldenrod, on the other hand, is insect pollinated and they have very sticky pollen. So it doesn't even really blow that, you know, doesn't drift into the wind much at all. It's meant to stick to insects to be carried from one plant to another. There are over 20,000 20, species of goldenrod in the world, 25 species in our region. And I would say that most people would probably be happy to just say, oh, it's a goldenrod. But I'm encouraging you to look closely at goldenrods because they really are quite unique and quite uh, different. Well, as I mentioned, they're adapted to, um, to insect pollination. Look at the number of pollinators that will visit um, goldenrod. It is literally the group of herbaceous perennials that support the highest number of beneficial insects in New England. So we have moths, we have bees, we have wasps, we have butterflies, we have uh, the hummingbird moth. I mean, it just goes on and on. And here's some close-ups of some uh, uh, very unique um, uh, insects, including the, uh, the monarch butterfly. I have a very good friend who I'm going to thank, Jen Holmvulkan, for her. Um, she's a beautiful garden, and she's really into photography and taking close-ups of insect pollinators visiting her, visiting her garden. So uh, she's responsible for some of these close-ups here. Um, all right, so let's start at the beginning with goldenrod and how you could, um, how you can uh, tell them apart. They, you can look at flower shape, you can look at leaves, you can look at habitat, just as you would for many of our other plants. So notice here are three fairly common ones. Canada goldenrod, very common. It's a tall plant. It's got, it's got a big bushy flower. It's got flowers coming out in all different kinds of directions. Whereas the gray goldenrod, you see it just has literally one arch that's going over to the side. And it's also much shorter. Um, and then this one here, the lance leaf goldenrod is a tuft of flowers, a flat topped tuft of flowers, very different in, in design. All of the leaves are different. Um, these are long and, uh, and thin. Um, also the habitat where these grow, this gray goldenrod, is growing uh, on the riverbank, right? Um, in a very, very sandy area in my, the corner of my field. Whereas the Canada goldenrod would be more out in the middle of, of the field. You even have goldenrods then that are in the forest. And these two are very uh, easy to identify and fairly common. Zigzag gets its name for the way it literally zigzags up the stem of the plant and the flowers are growing in the axils of the, uh, of the stem. Blue stem, big hint there with this bluish color, purpley stem. And again, the flowers are growing in the axils of where the, of where the leaves are. So when you really do take the time to, to look and start um, uh, taking a closer look, um, it, it, it's, I'm not gonna say it's easy because you have to just look, but it's kind of fun. Newcomb's Wildflower Guide, which is my personal favorite um, wildflower guide. In the back, the last two, the last five, I'm gonna say 10 pages are all about goldenrods and asters. And if you just look through there, there's great pictures, there's great descriptions. And the last one that, oh no, there's two more. Okay, so we have another example, rough stem goldenrod. Again, big hint, look at that hairy stem. Though the flower may look like the Canada golden uh, rod, um, the Canada golden rod stem is completely smooth. So there's little tricks that you need to look and learn um, as you start looking at these uh, at these flowers. And then this is always an interesting one: silver rod, not golden rod, silver rod. It has whitish flowers, and I'm going to say you're going to find the silver rod growing 
right near where that gray goldenrod is going. Can you see how sandy that uh, soil is right there? The Wildcat River, just over the bank, right over there. And uh, this is just a nice patch of, of the silverrod growing there. So a whitish goldenrod. At the same time, we have um, the goldenrods blooming. We have the asters, and you know they are right up there with the um, goldenrods in terms of being great um, pollinators for many different kinds of insects, from butterflies and bees to uh, the hummingbird moth there as well. Not quite as many different kinds of asters, but there's a few, um, and. And honestly, I, I, I actually think they're a little trickier to identify than, uh, than the goldenrod. New England aster is one that a lot of people are pretty familiar with because it's big and it's really dark purple, deep purple, just a beautiful uh, flower. It's quite, uh, quite tall. Um, and all of these asters and goldenrods, the seeds become important food for turkeys, grouse, mammals, birds. Uh, later in uh, the season after they, uh, they go by. Um, here's where you have to start looking for, again, habitat, leaves, um, special things about their stem. Here's the heart-leafed aster, has teeth on it. And it's a much shorter flower and I would say more delicate flower than uh, the New England aster. And it uh, tends to be a shorter flower as well. Purple stemmed aster has this very unique dark reddish purple stem. This was growing in the middle of my field and uh, it's not as dense of a, um, a flower as the New England aster. And these are some of our purple asters, but then you also have white asters, and there's quite a few of those as well. Here we have the flat-topped aster, again, with this bright red stem. That's, I, uh, the stem color and texture really ends up being a big help in identification of some of these. And then the white wood aster, similar to uh, the heart-shaped uh, one we saw earlier, has a heart-shaped leaf and it's whitish but sometimes they tend to be almost a really pale lavender color. So it can be tricky, but these guys are growing in the woodlands versus um, some of these other asters that are growing right out in the open. Then there are some that grow in um, by uh, water and, uh, and so forth. So uh, very common roadside plant though as well. So go ahead and give it a go and see how you do with identifying your uh, asters and your goldenrods this, uh, this fall. Um, all right, now I'm gonna ask everybody to imagine hopping in a canoe or a kayak and going to your favorite wetland to, um, to see some of our aquatic uh, flowers. And uh, never underestimate the beauty of a cattail. The common cattail is a very interesting flower. You've got your male parts of the flower, that's real big spike up here, and the female parts are down here. These guys are probably in full bloom in mid-July to mid-August, and then they start going to seed like these over uh, over here. Um, but the, the common cattail, it really is a pretty amazing plant. It is very edible. You can eat almost any part of, uh, of a cattail, from the lower leaves to the young flowers can be, uh, roasted. You can even eat the pollen. You can dig up the root and uh, dry it and grind it to make some kind of um, flour. Um, but the seed pods were also used for a number of different things as well. They were excellent fire starters. They used to use them for stuffing, for clothing, pillows, mattresses, quilts, and even life jackets. So, and again, these are all plants that like to have their feet wet. They're growing right in the water. Same with cotton grass. And it's actually not a grass, it's a sedge having a, uh, a three-sided stem, but it has this bright tuft of these white cotton seed, uh, seed heads. And you can just, uh, anyone recognize this view? This is Pondicherry up there, looking out over and seeing all the white cotton grass uh, growing in there. It's a grows in acidic wetlands, very common in the north, in boggy areas. Um, and uh, it, it's um, actually um, 
was uh, it's good food for grouse and other kinds of uh, wildlife. And this also fluffy seed head was used to um, protect wounds in uh, our early wars, World War I or so. So um, it's interesting. You use what was available, and uh, and that's what they and that's what they did. Um, cardinal flower kind of writes right out there with the gentian as being kind of a unique and not so common flower. And also there are very few red flowers, just, are, just as there are very few blue flowers in, in the wild. So it has this beautiful uh, design with the long protruding uh, neck. Again, just a perfect flower for hummingbirds to pollinate, the color, the shape of the flower. The cardinal flower and the hummingbird are so intricately related in that um, their actual range is very similar. Um, you know, the cardinal flower goes that far north, the hummingbird's range goes that far north. They grow in wet areas. If um, It's always a treat to come upon one. Could be a stream, could be a quiet side of a, of a lake or a, uh, or a marsh. And um, unfortunately, they uh, have been over collected in the past and the loss of wetlands over time has really affected this uh, flower as well. And here's the infamous turtle head that I had mentioned earlier. Believe it or not, I thought this was interesting. The turtle head is in the same family as the mullen. That just seems very, uh, very odd to me. But Anyway, the turtle head, you can tell where it gets its name. That little flower looks just like a turtle's head. And if you ever have the, can the chance, or if you have young children, you can take the little flower heads and, and uh, make them talk. It's quite uh, humorous, but you can see that it's tightly closed and that bumblebee is gonna have to work hard to uh, get in there. It's, a, fam it's a, a flower that grows in wetlands. And here we have this great patch of uh, turtle heads. Um, and this butterfly actually plays an important role, has nothing to do with pollination. This just goes to, to show that um, flowers provide important sources. This is a checker spot butterfly and they actually lay their eggs on turtle heads. And then once the eggs hatch, the caterpillars will then form a web to make it through the winter. They live on the turtle head leaf and then next spring, or will continue growing and at some point form a cocoon to hatch into the checker spot. So the turtle head plays an important role in the life cycle of this uh, particular butterfly. Sweet scented water lily, I'm sure many of us have seen that. All the water lilies and pickerel weeds are such important hosts for so many other uh, insects and wildlife that lives in the water. They have this beautiful white flower that of course is sweet smell and all kinds of insects um, will visit it. But then we have these great leaves that, that um, provide protection. You've got great macro invertebrates, dragonfly nymphs, stoneflies, mayflies swimming underneath there, which then brings in the fish that are coming in to eat the insects. Um, then you'll have muskrats coming in to eat the roots of these plants. And it's not just the uh, sweet, sweet um, water lily, but this uh, yellow water lily or what we call spatter duck. Very different, yellow flower. And here is one open. Oftentimes you just see them uh, clenched uh, tight, but notice how thick the stem is and a very different kind of uh, leaf there. Again, beavers, muskrats, uh, all kinds of uh, ducks diving down to eat the uh, roots of these plants. Pickerel weed is a, another uh, wetland flower with this purple racine, that spiky flower there, and literally growing right in, uh, in the water. And true to its name, uh, fish like pickerels kind of hang out around the base of these, uh, of these plants. Now, here you have to get down a little bit closer to the water. These are actually two very tiny plants. Water shield, the, fly, uh, the leaf itself is probably about the size of a, um, um, maybe a 50 cent piece. Actually, another nickname for it is water penny, but it's a little bit bigger than a penny. But it has this tiny pink flower. 
and the stem is attached to the middle of the uh, leaf. You just you would kayak right through a whole huge patch of these. Um, we saw these up at Umbago uh, two weeks ago. And then this horned bladderwort is a fascinating, literally all you're seeing is these little yellow spikes. And they've got this little kind of loop at the end or this horn at the end. This is actually a carnivorous plant. If you look very closely, the leaves, there are these bladders attached to them that open up to allow uh, small insects and other organisms into that and they uh, supplement their diet with, uh, with those. So that's the horned bladderwort. Lastly, um, or close to lastly, whoops. Um, this is your absolute latest flowering shrub and that is uh, a witch hazel. And they have these awesome yellow spidery flowers that bloom in, I'm gonna say early October into even late October. And it's kind of an interesting, again, you might ask, why, why are they waiting so late? Maybe they just, they have, they've got known pollinators, these parasitoid wasps that specifically pollinate the witch hazel. Um, and they're successful. They, you often see seed pods on them the following, the following spring. And uh, yes, it is in fact the witch hazel that you would buy in a, a pharmacy or whatever. And the extract is made from, um, bark and uh, leaves for this uh, astringent that's used for treating bruises and insect bites and, and so forth. So um, those are most of the plants. I just had to add these last two. These came from my friend, uh, Jen, who has the beautiful garden. This is actually a, uh, this is a plant called Leatris and it's not native to around here, but it's a plant you might find on the prairie. But Look at all the butterflies on this flower here. And she had quite a patch of them. The flower, and then I, I'd be curious as to what the um, ratio of sugar in, uh, in the Leatris uh, nectar is because these, these butterflies were just covered. And then here's another one. And I would encourage anyone, this is our native bergamot or bee balm. I think most people know the red bee balm, which is a beautiful flower, but that is a perennial that has been developed. This is the native that you would find literally growing wild in uh, around here. And this is, I can never say the name of this butterfly correctly. It is a frillilit, oh, I'm, I'm really not doing it justice. For, uh, Great American fritillary. Thank you. I don't know why I found that. <laughs> but look again, how many are there in that uh, in that photograph there? So um, you know, and these can be very easily grown. I have a lot of these uh, in my uh, in my perennial garden at uh, my house as well. So um, okay, so. Quickly, I'll go through some resources. And I did send a list of some of the plants that I talked about tonight um, that Gal will be sharing with you. And then I will send tomorrow a resource list as well. I forgot to do that. So, but here's the Newcomb's Wildflower Guide that I mentioned. It's a key and it's, it's just, it's a great book to be able to figure out what you're looking at. We've got Wildflowers of the White Mountains, which is a key that is color coordinated. So let's say you saw a yellow flower, you turn it to yellow and then you can literally page through, which has its, uh, which has its uh, advantages too. Some of the background information, the more cultural and, and uh, medicinal history came from this, the Secrets of Wildflowers book, as well as this was New England's Mountain Flowers. This is an old book by Jeff Molnar from the um, Society to Protect the Rocks estate. And that's a, that's a lovely book. I've always liked this. This is new. I just picked this up this year, Native Plants of New England Gardens. If you are a gardener and you want to expand your native plants that you are growing in your garden, um, I would strongly encourage that book. And this last book, Shrubs of the Northern New England Forest, was written by uh, Dr. Michael Klein, who used to be the director at Tin Mountain Conservation Center. And it is a fabulous resource for identifying shrubs and it shows them blooming, it shows the fruits, it gives you all the background information. So that is a book that I would strongly recommend as well. And we sell that at Tin Mountain. If you would be interested, you could just give a call and 
we can make that happen. Um, and then quickly, some, some wildflower locations. I'll be the first to admit, um, if I'm thinking about Collis County, I'm coming up to Pondicherry. That's where I spent most of my time. But I have been to some of these other places. And I certainly asked David Gavatsky and another uh, friend of mine, Dr. Rick Vanderpoel. And these were some of the suggestions they had. Mud Pond, Pondicherry Trail, the Slidebrook Trail, which is uh, just terrific for wildflowers at this time of year. Beavers Falls in Stewartston, just up by the Mountain View Grand. Week State Park, of course, is a spectacular spot in all seasons for flowers. Mount Prospect in Lancaster. Moore Dam by the Connecticut River in Littleton. The Rocks Estate, uh, a number of people had mentioned that. And I added Lake Umbagog in there because I love going uh, up there. Now, if you're heading south and down into Carroll County, by all means, come down to Tim Mountain Conservation Center. And uh, we, uh, as I mentioned, have 300 acres of uh, trails and fields and forests and ponds and so forth. Don't feel like going all the way to Albany. We also have a location in Jackson on Tin Mine Road, 225 acres. And that also is fields, forests, and ponds. And there's a very cool tin mine in there. Um, the type of really going south, Thompson Preserve in Tamworth, that's an Audubon uh, Society sanctuary. That's a nice wetland area. And then Thorn Pond in Bartlett, which is just near Atatash, um, is uh, an interesting spot for poking around. And other locations, I had to throw this in there. One of my very favorite places, kind of reminds me a lot of, of uh, Pondicherry, is the Brownfield Bog in Brownfield, Maine, and it's outside of uh, the Freiburg area a terrific place for birding and uh, wildflowers and butterflies and just everything. And then I wrote roadsides anywhere because really at this time of year, you can't go wrong. Just go outside, take a walk, a, a walk and you'll see. Um, I also wanted to share with you that I will be leading a field trip up to Pondicherry on September 2nd from nine to noon as part of um, um, the Tin Mountain Conservation Center Nature Program Series. If that's something uh, you'd be interested in joining, go to our website. It's just tinmountain.org and um, follow the links to programs and you can sign up to be part of that program as well. All right, one last thing. Now, I'm trusting that many of you out there like wildflowers in all times of years, these pictures are pictures of spring ephemerals that have now produced fruit. And I'm wondering if anybody recognizes uh, any of these flowers. So why don't you take a minute to, uh, to take a look at them. If you have a piece of paper, even write them down and then uh, I'll go through and uh, we can take a look at them. And honestly, at this point, if you want to unmute and people want to tell me what they think it is, um, I think that that would be fine too. So any, uh, any thoughts on this one here? Okay, it has a unique name uh, and uh, the nickname for it is Doll's Eyes, but it's White Bane Berry, all right? So always takes you by surprise when you see it with those kind of kind of creepy looking berries. This is a relative of the white bean berry and that it's red, 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 red bean. bean berry. There you go, perfect. How about this one? Any, anyone know that one? Which one? The one in the, right in the middle. Oh, trillium. Yes, now here's the real one. Do you know which trillium? Painted or red? There's a trick, look right here. This one yeah. has a little, say it again. I don't, I'm not going to guess. <laughs> okay, it's painted. Painted has a little stem where it ha has, on the leaf, it has a stem where it attaches to the stem of the plant. If it was a red trillium, it would be completely connected. You wouldn't have a little stem at all. So that's, oh, I just gave that one away. <laughs> so bunch berry, I bet you most people knew that. That's a very common one. And then how about this? Anyone? Uh, Partridge berry? Or, no, this, it, uh, it's a berry. Oh, yeah. Yeah, it, it's Clintonia or blue bead lily. Yeah, blue bead right there. And then of course the painted trillium. All right, so there's that. And then I'm a sucker for shrubs and their fruit. 
as well. So uh, now I admit these are harder probably, but you might, you might recognize that because you can certainly eat them, make jelly out of them. I'll say elderberry. You got it, elderberry, common elderberry. How about this? I love this one. I just, because it starts out pink, almost white, and then turns blue. Is that some kind of a viburnum? Yeah, it is totally a viburnum. Very good. This is withrod, or oh. some people call it wild raisin. Yep. It's a large shrub. Um, okay, how about this one up here? I, again, I just love the shape and the design. I saw a chipmunk just feasting on some of these. And this, any? It's Choke Terry. Or oh, you are good, whoever it is. <laughs> and then how about this one? This is a fairly common one. That's um, hobble bush. You got it. Hobble bush it is. So there you go. I mean, I think at this time of year with the fall flowers and you get these berries, it's just such a fantastic time to be out exploring. So I'll leave you with this beautiful picture of Pondicherry. And again, photo credits to my friend Jen. I took uh, a lot of the pictures, but I also did use some um, pictures from online as well. So thanks to all those people out there. So uh, anyway, all right. I am totally open to question at this point. So um, yeah. uh, if anybody has any questions, please shout them out. Feel free. We don't have so many folks on here that we need to, uh, to worry too much about. Um, shouting over each other. So if you guys want to just unmute yourselves um, for anyone that does have a question, um, we'll give it a minute. Make sure that people have a chance to ask if they have something. Uh, Plantain trillium seed pods. The, um, the trillium seeds are kind of tricky in that. Okay, so you have a red berry. If you break that open, there's like a thousand little seeds in there. And they actually have a um, relationship with ants of all things that the ants will gather the seeds and take them to their uh, nests where they plant them in some kind of uh, bread or pot, I don't know, something in the ground, which actually helps. You could try planting them. It's a long way to say you could try planting them, but I think kind of like a mycorrhizal association with an orchid, there may need to be some um, relationship there. Um, there is a, uh, uh, there are some native plant nurseries that um, you can, that you can visit. This is one called Prairie Moon Nursery. It's in the Midwest, but they sell um, a lot of Eastern plants, Northeastern plants as well, and they cultivate them. So you're not out digging them up your own or moving them um, around. And you might have better luck getting something from them. So, um, okay. Any other? Uh, okay. Good for poison. Oh, poison ivy leaf, relief. Was that the uh, jewel weed someone had done? Uh, all right. All right. It doesn't look like there are any other questions. Okay. Yes. Uh, just wondering if anybody had any specific um, like photos or anything that they're having trouble identifying, could they email you? Oh, I love nothing help? more than a good challenge. <laughs> sure. Oh, good. <laughs> yeah, I will say, I think it's really, you know, it's interesting as I was getting ready, ready for this. I was using my phone, of course, to take pictures and it's hard. It's hard to get a good picture of a plant. So if you're if you're going to take a picture of a plant, try and get the flower, try and get the leaf and the stem. I think that it, particularly with goldenrods and esters, that um, taking a look at the stem uh, can help a lot. So, um, all right. Well, like we've oh, got a here, someone, about someone brought up. Uh, I'm sorry. Go ahead. Yeah. No. 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 Just from the chat. Uh, growing in the garden. How to grow in a garden in swaths or as they pop up? Uh, any plant in particular that they're asking about? Growing in a garden, it really depends. I'm not sure I understand. If, if it was about the trillium. Yeah. I don't know if Karen feels comfortable unmuting to try to 
give us yeah. a, a better understanding? Am I, can you hear me? Yes, we can. So, you know, I have fields and woodlands on this property and I try not to mow, you know, the goldenrod or right. the asters or the this, but if I want sort of, you know, yeah. how, how would you encourage them to grow? I mean, I left a patch of milkweed, for instance. Yes. Yeah. I, I just let it go up. But in my proper garden, sometimes things pop up and I yeah. think, oh, I feel like I should pull it out, but yet I like it. So I leave it. Yeah. And it's yes. kind of hodgepodge, but then I have, I do have a big clump of the black eyed Susan because I like that. And then I think maybe I should put that in the field uh, to spread. I feel your pain. I, that's all I can say. I, I go through this battle all the time in my garden. Oh, joy. You know what? I just, I, pr I pretty much let things be where they are. At some point, there's just too much. I'll weed it out. And, uh, but you know, it's, it's obviously going to like your garden because it's this great fertile soil, you know, yeah, and it's right. just, so I can I understand that. If um, I tell you a great resource is um, your local NRCS office, Natural Resource Conservation, I can have service. And um, so I don't know where yours would be up there in Jefferson, maybe? I don't know, but That's they great. are wonderful. At, uh, or your, um, your your local conservation district office. They okay. just are a wealth of information. And they even have a number of different programs that you can be involved in that can help you answer those kinds of questions or, you know, even add different shrubs, flowering shrubs and plants and things to your to your garden. So I would suggest uh, calling them um, as uh, as well. I'm noticing someone mentioned in here about um, using iNaturalist. I didn't even mention any of the kind of online uh, plant ID things. Um, and there's a ton of them. I guess there's one called Plant Seeker. There's another one. I'm forgetting the name of it. And I I go back and forth. I like. I think I don't want to use them because I don't want to become relying on them just to hold my phone up and say, oh, it's a, oh, it's a, I want to try and figure it out. But if I'm with somebody who has one, my son, hey, use your plant thing. What is that? You know? So, but I was also with someone the other day and she was like, she really took some time to try and think it through, made a guess, and then she did it. So there are ways to do it. And those things, they're cool. You know, I mean, but you got to watch them because they're not always correct. So, so anyway, but yeah, there's so much you can get. I mean, I use bird apps all the time. So I don't know really what the difference between that and plants, but um, yeah, someone mentioned the furry leaves of mullein were also used by indigenous people to line their mo moccasins. Oh, Lancaster is where the NRCS office is. That's right. Great. Thank you. Uh, I did read that. I thought that was pretty cool. Actually, that's smart. You know, the mullein leaves are thick. They would be warm. I could see that. So anyway. All right. Well, all right. Uh, well, hopefully I'll see some of you um, join us up at uh, Pondicherry. That would be uh, fun. And if you do, please introduce yourself and tell, tell me that you attended this. So anyway. Yeah, I'll, I'll make sure to add the, um, the info into our next newsletter uh, which okay. should go out next week right. sometime so all right. can keep an eye out for that as well all right i'll add it thank on you to the so much thing. oh thank you this is great as i mentioned it got me to do this and i'm i'm thrilled <laughs> to have shared this with you all right well yeah, stay we're cool so happy everyone to have you. yes thank right. you everyone thanks for yep. joining us all right enjoy